Okay, good morning. Uh, thank you for joining us this morning for our uh, Forward Thinking Farming webinar brought to you by uh, Pioneer Agronomy. This morning we're talking about Gibberell ear rods. We're going to talk about sort of Pioneer and Corteva's research and development efforts, how we have go about product characterization, and then as well some um, management recommendations that growers can implement on their own farm. Gibberella ear rot is a disease of economic significance here in Southern Ontario, where I am the district leader. I'm Rachel Faust, district leader here in Southern Ontario, based in Chatham. Kind of an exciting day here today. We'll be in the uh, path of total totality for the solar eclipse. So this is a, it's an exciting day. We get to have this webinar as well as a solar eclipse. So those are two things that don't happen every day. Uh, so here in my area, we have um, Gibberella ear rot. Many we, we'd rather not have it, but we have it quite frequently. Uh, as well as this past year, we saw the disease pressure uh, in a broader area across the Northeast Corn Belt. So that's why we've pulled together a group of our scientists, researchers, and agronomists to talk today about Gibberella ear rot. Uh, our first speaker of the day is Peter Horvage. He is research scientist based in uh, Pennsylvania, and he's going to talk about um, the disease overview, the history of the work at Pioneer. Then we'll hear from Sheila Murphy, Technical Services Manager for Eastern Canada, talking about our characterization efforts uh, and how we go about rating those hybrids and providing that information to our sales teams as well as our customers. And then we'll hear from John Saliga, agronomist in Southern Ontario, talking about some of those management suggestions. So I think... Uh, in my over 20 year career here uh, in the seed industry and with Pioneer and Corteva, uh, we're in a really great spot and maybe the best spot we've ever been in that time for having a better understanding of the disease and the characterization of our products before they ever make it to the field. Uh, so I'm excited to share some of that information with you today with this uh, team of experts. So I'll turn it over to uh, Peter now um, to, to kick it off. Thank you, Rachel. Um, yeah, good morning, everyone. Um, as uh, Rachel said, um, I am a research scientist, a plant pathologist. Um, so you know, I'm in plant pathology group of Pioneer, and I specifically support field pathology. Um, I'm based in southeastern Pennsylvania, and um, obviously, you know, one of the traits that is on everybody's radar in, in Northeast and even more uh, Great Lake area uh, is uh, Gibberella ear rot. Um, <clears throat> so um, Gibberella um, ear rot um, as, a, as a disease, um, it's, it's caused, and I, and I put there, you know, also Gibberella ear mold, you know, some areas it's, it's called ear rot or ear mold. Um, and very frequently, I guess you can see it in or in our product catalog and the abbreviation of Chibers. Um, I put there uh, this information even in the title because that's where the name is coming from, the pathogen name, so the name of the trait. Um, it's called by Giberella Z, but the other name that you might have come across is Fusarium graminearum, and that name actually gives name uh, of the disease in wheat, but it's still the same fungus, it's still the same pathogen, um, but, uh, you know, different name was picked also for the trade. Um, it, it is very common pathogen um, from the pathology point of view. Um, you cannot really get completely eradicate or you know get rid of this pathogen. Uh, just the main reason is because it just has more than forty five hosts that it can infect. Um, obviously, uh, for the purpose of this seminar and presentation, we will talk uh, about the corn, but it can infect a big, um, pretty wide variety of hosts. It's distributed worldwide. Um, it's not just unique to any specific area um, in terms of you know the distribution, and it commonly um, 
uh, overwinters as most of the pathogen, fungal pathogens in the crop residue. Um, and it's spread also kind of typical way the spores are spread um, during those rain events and, you know, splashing events and then wind helps it. So nothing different there than other pathogens. And um, for corn, uh, and specifically gibberella ear mold. So if we talk about this trait, the infection occurs um, through silks. That's that's kind of most most common avenue how the fungus um, gets in. Um, so you know you might wonder like you know what is uh, so if it's like such a common pathogen. Um, why is it uh, common in some areas and why not in the others? And the reason is, uh, the main reason for the disease is the environment. Um, it favors cool temperatures. Uh, that's common also for a lot of pathogen, but pathogens, but mainly what is crucial for the onset of disease in ears um, of corn is the uh, you can have the pathogen around, uh, you can have even susceptible host, you can have those cool temperatures, but if you don't have the humidity, you most likely don't get disease. Or even if you would get disease, in order for disease to progress um, and you know grow and colonize the host, it really needs the humidity. Um, if you remove the humidity, um, you are not going to get successful, you know, in the broad sense, um, disease. Uh, what is also kind of interesting for this disease and uh, host pathogen interaction is the timing. Um, because like I said, the most common is um, that uh, it needs to infect the silk. That's the most common way how the pathogen gets in and um, then can get also during the early stages of um, kernel development. However, the most common way is through the silks. And that's why for this disease, you see it coming from the top of the ear and you know more, more making its way down to the bottom. Um, and obviously, this environment, um, and that's why we have this um, webinar uh, uh, for for this audience, <laughs> is um, that it's the weather conditions are very favorable in the Great Lake area. Um, as I have it there, uh, you know, circled that area. That's where we most commonly we see it in in Ontario, Michigan. And that corner, um, northwest corner of Pennsylvania. Sometimes it can be in some pockets of New York area around those Finger Lakes, but uh, really kind of most commonly where we can see it, it's really Ontario and, and Michigan, that thumb of Michigan. Um, <clears throat> in terms of what the disease causes, so obviously it reduces yield. Um, however, it also affects the grain quality. Um, so you, as a grower, you know, you just not have the lower yield, but also you might get less paid for that yield because, you know, the kernel quality can be affected um, as a fungal disease of, of the corn, the product that you harvest. It affects also storage life of your product if you intend to keep it for longer if there is some infection. And obviously the most uh, why everybody pays attention to this disease is that it causes mycotoxins. Um, so, um, you know, knowing all this, I would just like to spend some time to discuss what we do in Pioneer or Corteva, um, because, you know, obviously it, it has the effect. So um, in, in Pioneer, uh, we have uh, two uh, research stations. Uh, we have had, um, you know, for a number of years um, that are supporting um, or targeting uh, for the research program and breeding programs. Uh, one is in Woodstock, Ontario, 
And on the US side, the other stations is in Michigan, Ithaca. Um, in Ithaca, uh, this station has been established in 1986. Um, there is currently uh, one breeding program. And obviously, you know, because of the northern part of US, um, the breeding program supports around the 95 high 100 CRM. Uh, it's the research that is done uh, for that corn. And um, we do consider um, Ithaca for us as a disease center of excellence. Um, what does that mean? That we have some stations designated that uh, you know target several diseases. And as you can see there, and the list, uh, Gibera Aerod is obviously the main target. There is more than 25 years of, um, they have done the inoculations. So they don't just rely on the natural infection, but also at the stations, they do inoculate the trials. The other disease is Northern Corn Leaf Blight, obviously now tar spot and also white mold in, in soybeans. That's why um, it has quite a, uh, research uh, presence there. On the Ontario side, um, there is Woodstock uh, Research Center. Um, that one was established, uh, at least what I found, that way before my time, obviously, <laughs> um, 1968. Um, there are currently three breeding programs. Uh, you can see, you know, the CRMs are a little bit shorter. Um, so it's um, all the way from 85 or even a little bit earlier up to 95. Uh, so those are the research programs based there. But they do because of the late, <coughs> excuse me, of the late effect. Um, so the area or the teams in Ontario, they are able to test uh, for yield all the way to 103 CRMs and from 75 to 103. And they do also inoculated gibberella trials, the same kind of like Ithaca, more than 21 years of experience. And currently, actually, both stations are evaluating even new methods um, for um, inoculations because the inoculations for these pathogens are not easy, uh, not uh, simple. It's sometimes hard to replicate that um, environment uh, that is kind of unique uh, in that area. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, you know, knowing this, um, I wanted to put this slide up there uh, kind of to explain everybody why the breeding is complex, because it is. Um, obviously, working with ear, um, you know, you have already complexity there. I know if you would compare this with the foliar diseases where you have just leaf um, as a tissue or organ of plant, it's a little bit more simple than when you have ear uh, where you have several tissues interacting, whether it's a cup, it's a husk leaves, you have kernels, you have silk, um, all this play a uh, role in this host pathogen interaction. So there are listed several types of resistance that the breeders have to take into account. Uh, obviously, first is silk, husk cover, we know uh, it plays a role, husk tightness, how the husk is open or you know tight. And then obviously the kernels. Um, we have seen over the years that you know some hybrids they can have a good is silk resistance, but once the kernel uh, once the kernels get infected, pathogen goes to the kernels. The other ones can be vice versa, and also even a cop composition. So uh, we have seen in number of years and hybrids that uh, pathogen there might be a good kernel resistance, but pathogen is able to grow through the cop, kind of like under the kernels. Um, so all those plays role. And all of those uh, tissues obviously make uh, uh, the breeding and, and uh, you know, search for resistance a little bit more uh, complicated. Um, 
in in the uh, so what can or what do the breeders do or what they can do? So obviously the first um, plus is that we have stations in that environment, um, so we can uh, test in the field. Uh, so that's like a first advantage uh, that we have dedicated research there. Um, the other way, like I said, is um, even indirectly, you know, breeders can select for um, uh, husk uh, that would not be, uh, you know, so tight. However, um, I want to point here regarding this husk tightness that um, for some other diseases, as for example, fusers, uh, fusarium ear mold, um, you don't want open husk, uh, so or you don't want short husk. Uh, so um, it's it's kind of a balance that breeders and uh, have to try to find uh, because one, you know, one characteristic might favor one disease and the other way around. Um, also, um, you know, we can pay attention to the ears. Um, Obviously, the best is uh, because this pathogen, like I said, it needs moisture. So, you know, the ears that um, maybe dry down faster, uh, they can kind of uh, resist better, um, the, even if the pathogen succeeds, uh, but maybe might not be able to colonize uh, so profusely. Um, we have uh, seen uh, and we have in pipeline the resistance genes and you know the research is ongoing but like i said it's it's very complicated um to work uh, with this pathogen so it's sometimes not so uh, straightforward um <clears throat> in terms of uh, screening what do we do um we uh, assess in the field and we found throughout the years that it's important not to do the visual scoring, but also to do a tactile component, kind of to look under the uh, kernels. Um, you can see it on, on the slide that um, you can have even the kernels um, that uh, visually they look um, that there is no pathogen, but uh, when you remove the kernels, uh, I believe it's on, on the next slide that I have there. Um, yep, uh, on this one that uh, you would visually not see or maybe on the tip if you would remove those, uh, you know, that uh, silks, the dry silks. But if you remove the kernels, uh, very often you might see uh, the pathogen kind of runs uh, underneath at the base of the kernels. Um, and this impact has a great impact on mycotoxin contamination. Um, so what we also found over the years um, that, um, and we are very uh, in pioneer, um, I would say or as a pathologist in pioneer, we are very fortunate is this impact network where uh, we have quite a bit of, of the fields uh, around in the area and we can actually kind of like a cherry pick uh, if there is, uh, you know, if the nature provides us uh, good uh, infection opportunities to screen. Um, so we can even uh, find the fields. We are notified by the uh, local uh, agronomists and sales in the region and can score like you see on this slide. Like from last year, we had opportunities even to visually target and obviously, there is much more uh, that can be even sampled for mycotoxins. Um, so with this, I will stop there and uh, I will pass it on to Sheila. Thanks, Peter. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Sheila Murphy. I'm the Technical Services Manager for Pioneer for Eastern Canada. And just before I continue, uh, if you have any questions, you can use the Q&A feature. Uh, it's a little bubble at the bottom of your screen, and uh, we'll keep an eye on that, and we should have time for some questions and answers as, as we finish up here today. So what Peter, Peter started me off really well to describe JIB evaluation in what we call impact plots. Um, these are our late stage testing plots. Materials in these plots 
are candidates be to become commercial hybrids. And it's important to note that these are on-farm research trials grown right across North America. And the cooperators who partner with us on these treat the plots as they would their own crop. So using their norm normal growing practices under their own fertility, herbicide, or fungicide management programs. Then our research teams can collect data on these candidates for both yield and agronomic traits. So these plots really allow us to see the candidates across a wide variety of environments and growing practice practices. And in particular, it presents us with opportunities to score diseases, notably Jib in southwestern Ontario. And agronomists and others evaluate these products during the last stages before advancement to help provide feedback on initial trait score ratings. And these observations are so valuable to the breeding organization, especially as areas outside of southwestern Ontario rarely see such significant jib infection. So in 2018, in addition to the jibbers hands-on work that Peter and others have done, when southwestern Ontario experienced its severe jib ear rot infection in 2018, we started to sample the impact plots for Dawn. So that's the mycotoxin that causes livestock refusal and of course, challenges for producers at the elevator. And these observations add to that gibber's work that Peter described to help us provide trait scores and knowledge on our potential commercial products. But we don't stop there. Once our hybrids are advanced from the breeding team to a commercial product, we still rely on feedback from the fields and sales team. Agronomists, sales reps, and others continue to evaluate products in yet another set of on-farm trials. We call these pioneer product knowledge plots, and you'll know them as the fields you see driving around with the little red and white signs. They're not just showcase plots, as you might think, but PKP cover a huge portion of our geography across management, climate, and soil type. PKP and the pioneer sales reps who execute them provide valuable feedback as to how those initial ratings hold up. And their observations are shared back with the breeding teams who can then re-review a product if necessary. So our trait scores are supported by these highly experienced sales reps who have solid experience with the ratings as well as the products. And their role is to offer management suggestions and products to help farmers grow healthy crops and make profitable, um, profitable fields. So it's in these PKP plots that we've invested a significant amount to understand the reaction of our hybrids to jib. And these maps on the next slide show the locations of the plots that have been sampled for Dawn for the last two years, colored by the average vomitoxin or dawn of each plot. And over the last two years, our Pioneer Network has sampled an outstanding amount of hybrids for dawn. We've sampled 290 PKP plot locations, which represents just shy of 3,000 grain samples, representing 162 hybrids. That is phenomenal. That is the power that we have with boots on the ground, whether it's in the research teams that Peter described or our various pioneer sales agencies across the region. And what have we learned? So this is, this is a very busy slide, which I don't expect anyone to be able to read, but it shows the results for pioneer hybrids over the last two years. And just wanna set the stage here about how we, um, how we report these results. We express the level of Dawn as a percentage of the plot average. This helps us to take away some of the plot noise and look at the hybrid itself rather than whether a location happened to be really hot or really low Dawn. So if a per data point was 100%, that means that the Dawn value for the hybrid in that plot or location was equal to the location average. Values below 100% are better, while as you increase in percentage, the hybrid has higher relative dawn to the other hybrids in the plot. So if a plot average was 5 ppm dawn and a hybrid value was 200% of the average, 
that hybrid would have had a dawn level of 10 ppm at the plot. These box plots for each hybrid show the performance of a hybrid across all of those locations that it was in. In some cases, we had hybrids represented in 162 PKP plot locations. The box shows where most of the results fell, while the tails or whiskers show the full spread. And then, of course, we have a few dots that are considered outliers to the normal trend, but are real data, so we include them. And then that white line in the middle of the box is the average of all the data for that hybrid. So that's your statistics lesson that I don't think you thought you were getting today, but important to set the stage. So the boxes are sorted by from lower dawn to higher dawn. And this information is really useful to help us understand any hybrids reaction or risk of dawn across the last two years. And while we know that we can't predict exactly what PPM level uh, a hybrid would have in a particular field, this information really helps us to predict a hybrid's relative risk of dawn levels. And as we look over the last two years, we had really great environments where 2023 had some significant dawn levels and 2022 a little bit less. And the data set is so powerful in the number of locations and hybrids that were sampled. It gives us a very clear picture about how these hybrids may express dawn in Ontario, Michigan, or Ohio in other years. And I also want to note um, the work that the Ontario Corn Committee has done. They initiated dawn screening in, after the 2018 outbreak. And while the methodology between the OCC trials and the PKP effort is different, the results of the Pioneer PKP sampling and the inoculated DAWN trials of the OCC are showing very similar trends in relative risk for DAWN. So we're really learning a lot about our environment and the products that we put in them. So looking at a smaller set of hybrids now so that you can get your eyes, you don't have to have your eyes checked. We can see that the hybrids on the left of the screen have a lower relative risk than those on the right where the percentage of the location average is higher. And importantly, these results are consistent with what we know about our products because of the work we've been putting into them since day one. On the next slide, I've added the Pioneer trait scores for Gibberell ear rot, where one is the worst and nine is the best. Hybrids with lower relative risk have higher scores, and those that we know have high risk, in this case, have scored a three. There are few of any products immune to disease. So in our catalog, you'll see most of the products rated three to eight for many of the diseases we face. Jib, however, is so challenging that we have yet to hit the eight score and keep all the agronomic strengths and yields that are needed to make a well-balanced hybrid. So now I'll turn it over to John Saliga to talk about how you might use this information on your own farm. Thanks, Sheila. Uh, I am the uh, area agronomist for southwestern Ontario, so the deep, the southernmost part of, of our province, and uh, it aligns very well with uh, some of the neighboring states that Peter mentioned earlier. And what I'm going to go over here is some practical grower recommendations that uh, that all of you can use to help mitigate and manage the risk uh, around this disease. So the first thing that obviously we're going to discuss and the first thing that you probably consider when uh, when planning for your crop is obviously selecting the product. And I think it's it's important to understand what you can control as a producer. Uh, the weather is not one of them and never most likely will be one of them. And so being in Southwestern Ontario or in the neighboring states around it, we have to acknowledge the, the impact that the weather has and the environment has and make decisions on things that we have control over. So first and foremost, 
let's use the information uh, that Peter and Sheila have outlined around the JIB score and the vom the vomitoxin database that we have available to us. These are two really good starting points for us to consider in terms of managing the risk on your farm. And of course, lastly, uh, something we've always recommended to our producers, plant a package. And by planting a package, we help to spread that risk uh, for things such as gibberella ear mold. The next thing to consider, of course, would be fungicide. And there are several fungicide options available to Ontario producers. And of course, Jib is one of many diseases uh, that corn producers have to manage and consider when growing a crop. But I think what you need to do first and foremost, if jib is a concern, is consider the impact of the different actives in the fungicides that you're considering using. Okay, we are, uh, or we do understand that the triazole components of some of these fungicides are is really the component that has efficacy and has shown some uh, some suppressive capabilities with the gibberella pathogen. The next important part of fungicide use for managing risk around gibberella ear mold would be recognizing <clears throat> that there is a there is a timing window, and of course, it accessing the silks is critical. Peter mentioned that <clears throat> silks are the primary point of infection for this pathogen. And so we need to have proper timing and proper placement of the fungicide in order to realize any potential efficacy on the disease. And we definitely have seen uh, promising results uh, across the countryside where fungicides have been used to help manage this uh, disease. Next on our list of considerations would be insect control. And of course, the ear feeding pests like western bean cutworm, uh, horn earworm, they have the potential to make your crop vulnerable to gibberella ear rot. So aside from that primary infection point through the silk, if we have insect feeding on our, on our ears, that is an opportunity to open up a potential infection point for the jib pathogen. Western bean cutworm, as many know, is a fairly common pest in the Great Lakes region. Uh, it wasn't years ago, but it is today. And so it, it, at risk of, of uh, upsetting folks, scouting for this pest should be part of your plan. And I will be the first to admit scouting for Western bean cutworm is not fun. But understanding what potential pressure you might have from this insect is an important start to deciding whether you need to deploy uh, some kind of measure to manage it. And of course, there's a couple of options to managing insects in our corn crop. Uh, one would be the VIP3A gene. Uh, you'll know it as uh, in our Pioneer lineup as a Leptra product. And of course, the other option uh, would be timely applications of an insecticide such as Delegate. These, these two approaches are available to us here in Ontario and can be effective at managing, <clears throat> managing these, uh, these insects in the crop. Okay, next on the list <clears throat> is harvest timing. So jib is an endemic disease for the Great Lakes region. 
Uh, we deal with it every year somewhere in our territory. Uh, so much so that OMAFRA does a yearly survey to help pressure test what the environment has given us in terms of potential infection levels. And this is a great start to understanding, uh, understanding the risk in any given year. Sheila mentioned, of course, 2018 as being probably the worst year we've ever seen uh, uh, jib infection and, and vomitoxin levels. But the important thing to remember is that harvest timing is one of the management options that you have in your toolbox. So monitoring our crops for this disease should be a standard operating procedure and scouting and recognizing your risk on a field by field basis. Not every year deals us challenges with jib, but as a producer, knowing and understanding what levels of infection you may have across your acres will help you target and prioritize field harvest. The, probably the primary driving factor be, uh, behind when we harvest our corn crop typically has to do with grain moisture uh, because obviously there's a cost in removing that moisture from the grain. However, in years where gibberella is a concern, and we have higher levels of infection, I challenge you to consider adjusting those thresholds and prioritizing those fields that have higher levels of infection and get them harvested earlier. So <clears throat> why harvest earlier? Drying and storage. Now, this is this represents kind of the last opportunity you as a grower have to influence the quality of the grain that you are going to ship out and sell in the commercial market okay jib is known to continue to grow at moisture levels above 155 uh, that of course is our that is our threshold in the marketplace for dry corn. And I will challenge you, one of the ways you can manage your risk in years where the jib pressure is higher and the potential for vomitoxin is higher, drying your corn to 15% or less would be a wise choice. I'm not sure that a lot of you appreciate wanting to do that, I realize there's a weight, uh, there, there's a, a weight loss when we dry below that level. But again, this is about having some insurance around what the quality of the product is going to be that the elevator receives. Now, hot pockets uh, that do exist in fields, and we've seen this fairly commonly uh, in our environment, those hot pockets can end up in a tank and if they are if they remain wetter than that 155 they have the potential to continue to produce toxins while they're in storage so managing that is crucial the other and final point that i'm going to make is we we definitely have experience around cleaning grain uh, both in front of or behind your dryer, uh, removing those higher toxin contaminants from your sample can truly help improve the quality of the final product that gets shipped off farm. So in summary, I would just like to say you've, you've got really five opportunities in the growing season uh, to manage your risk around gibberella ear mold and the potential for vomitoxin in your crop. Product selection, where you'll work closely with your sales agent to understand the best choices. Fungicides, again, timely 
and getting it onto the silks is crucial. Insect control, knowing whether you have insects as a, as a potential threat and being able to manage them, timely harvest and dry and store your grain wisely. I'd like now to hand it back over to Rachel and we'll have an opportunity to potentially address any questions that might arise from the information that we've shared with you. Thanks, John. And thanks, Peter and Sheila. That was uh, a great information. Quick hit of some of the great work we're doing to help manage gibberella ear rot in our area. Uh, there are a few questions in the chat. Uh, maybe the first one I'll turn to Sheila, but um, we've done a lot of Dawn sampling and you shared the vast amount of samples we've done over the last couple of years in particularly. Where was that Dawn testing done? Uh, yeah, thanks, Rachel. We've been on a bit of a journey with uh, Dawn testing. Of course, we have uh, lab facilities in Johnston, Iowa at our North America head office. So we did sending start sending some of the lab samples there for more wet chemistry in detailed analysis. But of late, we've been able to partner with a local Ontario lab um, that's been able to give us really good results that are consistent with our wet chemistry information out of our Johnston lab. So samples are, are submitted to a central lab in southwestern Ontario, uh, which is giving us good results uh, quickly in the harvest season, season that we can use. Awesome. Um... Maybe this one's for Peter. Uh, it was, do you monitor season to season other mycotoxins besides Dawn? Um, my pronunciation is probably not quite accurate, but xerolinone is high in many areas this year. Do we monitor for that year to year as well? Um, not really, actually. Um, I mean, yes, the, the, this fungus, it's known, you know, it can make... Um, I guess very commonly, actually, more in a small grains, um, like, you know, wheat or barley can make Um, But actually, more commonly would be the nibalenol. That's another toxin in the same family. Um, Xeralenone, for, you know, some of you, if, if you know, you know, it can uh, affect like a hormonal balance in the body of the animals and, and uh, reproductive systems. So it doesn't cause vomiting, but actually it can affect the birth rate and you know especially for the animals you know that if, if you want uh, for that purpose but no we don't actually um, commonly test for for this uh, mycotoxin because it it hasn't been so widely it's kind of interesting thank you you know for for this comment and maybe you know we something what we can look into if, if we hear more often that uh you know, I can maybe offline follow up or if, if you feel free to contact me and, you know, we can um, expand on this if you have seen it really high in any areas. Awesome. Thanks, Peter. Um, maybe a question for you, John. Uh, you mentioned triazoles are a fungicide to potentially use um, to target JIB. Any comments on recent research for efficacy of pitifometazam? Them? Easy um, and also, hmm? easy for you to say. Yes, isn't <laughs> it? Um, and then also, any comments about potential increased dawn levels when a stro a strobe fungicide is used? Yeah, so I, I'm not familiar uh, with the research on pyrifluorometafen, uh, unfortunately. But I will, I will definitely investigate it now that you've mentioned it. Uh, I will also suggest uh, that we we have experienced in over time uh, some what I believe are negative influences of the strobe products, uh, where they potentially can contribute to elevated elevated vom levels. We we understand <clears throat> we understand that dynamic very well with wheat and and of course Ontario's wheat crop sees a lot of triazoles at T3 at that heading for control of the exact same organism 
that causes gibberella ear mold in corn. What, what I feel is maybe not as clear is the dynamic with corn uh, and, and, you know, do we see consistently the same responses from, from say the triazoles over the strobes? We, in the marketplace, we have transitioned to more multi mode of action products, which I think uh, at the heart of the issue is, is good, it's wise. We wanna be using multiple modes of action. We're also, now that we have tar spot in our environment, we're also very challenged to help control that disease. The strobes are very, very effective uh, on tar spot. So, so I think it, it's, a, it's a complex disease as Peter has mentioned, and I would love, I would love to see a little more work done uh, on the fungicide, uh, on the fungicide side of the of the coin to better understand some of those dynamics. Thanks, John. Uh, maybe a question for Peter. Um, you talked a lot about. Uh, the phenotype of the plant. Could you maybe talk just about specifically about the cob and and the phenotype? Do you want upright or hanging cob for jib infection? Which one is preferred or better or helps mitigate it more? Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, I would say in general, any phenotype that um, helps with a faster dry down is preferred. Um, so um, actually, you know the you know breeders they can try and i'm sure that they did try if they can um affect you know that ear shank where, where the ear is like sitting and you know how how much actually can hang down i would say that's more preferred because if you have it too much upright you get that moisture into the into those husk leaves and they will hold it so you know if it's more hanging down um it will release that moisture However, it can affect, we know also that uh, if you go too far uh, in terms of a breeder, you know, if you go too far selecting for the trait, um, you might get some undesirable effects, you know, the ears can start be dropping off or, or you know, so it, there is like with everything, there is that balance. Um, yeah, to, to kind of find what, what, is, what is helpful, but not, not too much. Um, I, another follow-up question, Peter, um, you talked about native genes and traits for um, identifying germplasm with higher degrees of tolerance. Is there anything available on the horizon from a molecular side for jib ear mold? Um, not, not on the short end. Um, the, one of the complications that um, I would say is, um, or, or not, uh, not on the short-term horizon, is just because the way how you can test uh, reliably for this disease, uh, for the breeder selections, uh, they need uh, artificial inoculations. And that's why I mentioned that uh, what is kind of exciting for us now, we are trying with the stations, with those stations involved that I mentioned earlier, Michigan and uh, in Ontario, that uh, they are going to try um, new, uh, types of inoculations. Um, the reason is that the current inoculations, you know, uh, you need to test parents, obviously, you need to test inbreds. Uh, so way before, you know, the hybrid selection and, uh, you know, the common inoculations that are, when if you follow just what is in the literature, it, it's it's too strong to, uh, for the inbreds. So that that's also the complicating or harder factor uh, for, for the breeders um, to, to work with. But there are like these common traits, like I mentioned, that, uh, that affects um, in general agronomics that, you know, works for or against this disease that breeders, uh, you know, can utilize and they do utilize and they, they do have effect, even just the husk tightness and, and um, yeah. Thanks, Peter. 
Uh, maybe a question for John. Um, does field history of mostly corn or corn on corn in the rotation make dawn infection more likely in a hot uh, year where the environmental conditions are conducive to the disease? Yeah, so I, you know, practically speaking with all, all the agronomy training we get, uh, you would, you would definitely want to suggest that those fields would present higher risk. I'm, I'm not so certain that in our part of the world where, as I mentioned earlier, uh, jib is endemic in, in our part of the world, it's, it's everywhere. And I feel, I feel like when conditions are conducive and support that initial infection, there is enough inoculum present around us uh, that there wouldn't necessarily be that great a difference between those heavy corn on corn acres. Uh, the inoculum in those fields would no doubt be high, uh, but I'm not convinced that they would be that much higher than, than rotated acres uh, across our geography. Thanks, John. Um, a couple more questions for you, John, on fungicide application. Uh, one, could you make a comment on the efficacy of sort of aerial or plane or helicopter application versus ground rig for getting that fungicide on? Sure. A hot topic or a hot potato topic, maybe. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> so it would be it would be my understanding that, uh, you know, first and foremost, with these fungicide applications for control of any disease, water volume is is pretty crucial, and coverage is pretty crucial. And uh, the bias, historically, the bias has been for ground rigs uh, that are applying 20 gallons or more to the acre. They, they are well positioned. Uh, to to provide kind of that best coverage. Uh, now, there's been some research done uh, by some of our spray specialists in OMAFRA comparing plane helicopters. I'm not certain whether they've done <clears throat> whether they've done the unmanned drone applications yet, but um, there there are there is more work being done in that arena. Uh, but I do feel currently today with what we know, I think your your best option is a ground rig uh, with with that high volume. Okay, um, one more follow up question on fungicides was um, and another sort of debate or hot potato topic is that fungicides might potentially increase VOM mm. since it's sort of keeping that plant health stay green uh, longer and maybe slower dry down. Any comment on that? Yeah, that's uh, that would be a long-standing uh, debate that many of us have uh, in the industry. I guess what I what I typically do when talking about that subject is I I like to think like the disease and um you know, if you have strong plant health and you utilize uh, some of these strobe fungicides that are incredible, uh, incredible at protecting plant health and no doubt have been contributing to our overall yield potential uh, on the crop, at least in our geography. You also have, uh, have a tendency to extend uh, extend the time where the ear husk uh, remains green longer. And by doing so, you create an environment within that ear that is pretty, pretty pleasing uh, to the organism, to the pathogen. Uh, so, you know, in years where you don't have that initial infection, uh, say it's warm and dry at pollination, uh, the the levels of natural infection are low, it becomes less of a challenge or less of an issue. Uh, there, there is definitely 
room for additional work in this uh, in this area. And uh, but I, I I have certainly seen or witnessed situations where uh, where a fungicide application that included astrobe and there would have been other components to those applications, but where where we've seen the vomitoxins higher on applied versus non-applied. So it's it's not as black and white as any of us would like it to be uh, in the marketplace. Thanks, John. Um, we're coming to the end of our time here. So uh, I made it as one last question. Um, Sheila, you had shared some of the results of our Dawn sampling results. Ha if a grower wants to see those results, how can they uh, get their hands on those? Yep. Um, best bet is to contact your local Pioneer agency and they can um, assist you with, with taking a look at those results, helping with interpreting those results as well. Um, we have some good visualizations of looking at individual products and how they performed across Southwestern Ontario. Um, so we can really dive into the data and, and learn a lot. So your Pioneer Sales Agency and they can go to hold of me and if we need more info. I guess maybe just one follow-up question that uh, came in, Sheila, was like when we're advancing hybrids to commercialize, what um, what level of importance is jib tolerance in uh, in the advancement criteria selection um, versus other important characteristics like yield stocks, roots? Yeah, um, when we're advancing products to commercial, we always think the top, we always talk about the top three traits, yield, yield, and yield. Uh, we need to make sure that we're not forgetting about that. But uh, in Southwestern Ontario, jib is a significant factor in, in what we will bring. Uh, we don't want to expose our customers to any undue risk. And I'm very proud to say that we're, we're getting it, it right. We might not be perfect all the time, but we have enough information that we can make difficult decisions if we need to, to make sure that, that we are not putting our customers at, at a great risk, introducing products that are very sensitive to JIB. Well, thanks everyone. I wanna thank Sheila, Peter and John for uh, their, their sharing their wisdom with us this morning. And I wanna thank everyone for participating as well as the questions. Uh, we just want, we really are doing a lot of work on Jebbaril ear rod and feel like we're in about as good a position as we've ever been when it comes to understanding our genetics, characterizing those, and ensuring we have a low risk package to bring to market for our customers. If you have any additional questions or want to follow up, please talk with your local Pioneer sales agency. Uh, they'd be more than happy to answer your questions. Uh, we bring these forward thinking farming webinars to you to help bring uh, more productive tips and tricks and suggestions for you to help have a successful year. Everyone, I hope everyone on the call has a great growing season in 2024 and uh, really hope that we don't see any gibberella ear rod in the field, but know that uh, you've got a great team behind you at Pioneer thinking about how to make you have a successful season every year. Thank you, everyone. Have a great day.